Hi there! Welcome to Board Games with Scott. I've been gone for a while and so I've been trying to figure out some great introduction to start off with. Now many of you might know that I've been moving, so... Hi there! Welcome to Board Games with Scott. This is what my life has been because I've been moving for the last few months. But that's just silly and that doesn't have anything to do with the game in question. So I thought, well, maybe what I'll do is something with stop action with little components from the game. But that's all, you know, copyrighty and stuff. So, another idea I had was something like this. Hi there, welcome to our game to Scott. And today, I decided to go out and see a little bit of this and cut her. But then you can't understand anything. So I guess my big intro will be, oh shoot, here it comes. Hi there, welcome to Board Games with Scott. This is a show where I take a game and explain it and lightly review it and my goal is to help you decide if this is a game you'd be interested in purchasing. This week I'm talking about a game called Reef Encounter by Richard Breeze. Reef Encounter has been published by a number of different publishers, but in the US it's been published by Z-Man Games. I actually went to the Essen Game Fair in 2006 and had an interview with Richard about this game, so let's have him give us a brief introduction. <laughs> um, hi, this is uh, Richard Breeze. Um, I'm talking to Scott uh, at Essen 2006. Reef Encounter was the first game since Camilla Quinn which was not about little people uh, and not about the key land. Why was it different? One main reason, in uh, Reef Encounter you kill things and I don't have killing people in my games. So what that is, it's these little monsters here which is the shrimps which get eaten by the parrotfish. Um, and at the end of the game, you get points for the corals, the polyp tiles that you've eaten during the course of the game. It's for two to four players, and it'll take you, oh, 90 minutes to two hours to play. It's a strategy game that has a lot more going on than may appear at first glance. It's a very pretty game. You've got these little wooden shrimps, and you've got very pretty boards and pretty player aids, but it's actually a strategy game that's fairly abstract, wrapped around this theme. I actually asked Richard to talk a little bit more about the inspiration behind Reef Encounter. So, take it away. Okay. Um, Reef Encounter uh, is quite a complicated game. It's a game for gamers, very much so, and I think that probably accounts for its very high rating on the geek lists. Um, the game, the, the original idea for the game came from watching um, a TV series in the UK called The Blue Planet. Uh, it's been a big money spinner for the BBC, which is the main broadcasting company in the UK. It's sold worldwide, and it was all about life in the oceans, seeing some incredible shots of uh, um, just things you've just never seen before. Um, there was a big hunt with uh, killer whales attacking, I think it was a humpback whale baby and separating it from a, a, a mother. Um, there were many spectacular shots, but also very miniature shots as well. And on one of these programs you will see little shrimps who live in the corals and they're protecting the corals from being attacked by other creatures. And I thought, yeah, maybe there's a game here. And the other thing I'd never seen before, and I'd never really appreciated, is that some of the corals, actually, there's a huge competition for space on a coral reef. You think of a coral reef as being a very, um, searching for the right word, but a, not a very uh, dynamic environment, but just one where the corals grow very slowly and they all live in harmony. But actually they don't, and you watch this program and you actually see some of the corals attacking some of the other corals. It's only a little bit of a leap, but I thought, well, actually, I don't know which coral's stronger than which coral. If I was dealing with human beings, then I probably would be able to make a better guess, but with corals, you don't know. And in the game of Reef Encounter, you'll find that the relative strengths of the corals from one coral to another will change throughout the game. And a key part of the game is, a, is, is making the corals that you are looking for, uh, or, or collecting, um, you want them to be as strong as possible at the end of the game. 
So what do you get in Reef Encounter? We got a lot of really colorful bits. Of course, the one thing that people are always drawn to are these wooden uh, shrimp pieces. Now, if you'll remember, in another game we talked about little wooden men that were called meeples. So these little things, you could call them shrimples. So each player has shrimples in their color and you have a parrotfish and a little cube and this is very important. We'll talk about this later. Each player has a screen to protect their stuff, but of course it's one of the easy handy dandy tip over screens and throughout the game you'll constantly be knocking it over and saying bad words. Each player gets a reference sheet, which is going to be very important to help you remember the phases in the game. You use one board for each player, but each player does not own a board. Instead, the number of boards that are out just help you to control the number of spaces that are available upon which to play. There's a number of small tiles that are going to represent the coral, and these come in this cloth bag, which you're also going to have. There's a number of other wooden bits. You've got cubes, larvae cubes, and algae discs, and we'll talk about all of that later. And then you've got this board here. Now this board is important. This board is the environmental board and will show you which coral reefs are stronger and which are weaker as well as will allow you to select cubes and tiles as the game goes on. And I'll explain how all of this works a bit later. In order to help you understand the game, I'm going to start by actually talking about the goal of the game and then we'll come back a bit, little bit later and talk about the steps in playing the game. So let's move on to an overview of the game. <laughs> So the goal of the game is actually to feed your parrotfish. Feed me, I'm hungry. Your parrotfish has, well, a bottomless pit for a stomach, but you're going to be feeding it these coral tiles. And at the end of the game, these tiles are going to be worth one point each. So you want to try and feed your little fishy as many of these tiles as you can. At the end of the game, you're going to get a bonus for every tile based upon how dominant it is. So if yellow is dominant over four other colors, then I'm going to get an extra four points per yellow tile. So a total of five points per yellow tile. So you get anywhere between one to five points per color tile in your fish's belly at the end of the game. And that's the goal, to eat the coral that ends up being the dominant coral in the environment. Got that? Moving on. So, how do you get the coral tiles in your fish's belly? Well, you eat them. The way that works is the first thing you can do in your turn is you can choose to have your parrotfish come and eat one of your shrimp. Now, you start the game with four of these guys, and then they'll die off as the game goes on, and one way that you end the game is by eating up all your shrimp. Everyone will get one final turn, and then the game is over. So, at the start of your turn, you can choose to eat a coral reef of one color and the shrimp that's guarding it. And so this shrimp is currently on top of this whole reef. It's only guarding a small area, but it's claimed the whole reef. So at the start of my turn, I can say, I'm going to eat you. I'm hungry. I'm nom nom. Now, of course, it's very wasteful. Oh, by the way, that I'm nom nom noise, you have to make that when you eat it. So you go, I'm nom nom. The fish, they're very wasteful. They're messy eaters. So what actually happens are the first four tiles in the reef go out. You don't get them. They're gone. You get whatever is left as your score. So you drop those in your belly and you hope to make pink then stronger than the other colors as the game goes on. So that's what you're going to do. Four times during the game, you have the chance to eat your shrimp and the tiles that it's sitting on of one color. The first four go out and you get the rest. And that's how you're going to score points. Now we understand that you're trying to eat coral and they're going to be worth points at the end of the game. And the more dominant coral is going to be worth more points at the end of the game. So how do you know what's dominant? There are 10 of these tiles. One tile for each pair of colored corals in the game. And it's going to tell you what's dominant and what's recessive. So this tile tells me that the pink is dominant over the yellow because there's two pink and one yellow. If you flip it over, it shows that yellow is dominant over pink. So as the game goes on, you're going to be fighting to flip these tiles over, changing the ecosystem. So if you've eaten a lot of pink, then you're going to want it this side up. If you've eaten a lot of yellow, you're going to want this side up because that shows that yellow is stronger than pink. Now, these other symbols down here are also going to come into play. First notice there's a starfish on one side and there's no starfish on the other side. All that matters then is that when you start the game, you want to make sure that all the tiles either have the starfish showing or do not have the starfish showing. You're going to have 10 of these tiles. So they're either no starfish or with starfish. That's in setup. There's also going to be a rock and a little bitty hidden color. And these are going to be important a bit later in the game. I'll be talking about algae. And this will come into play when I talk about algae. So just know later when I talk about algae, that's how you know that this tile has blue algae showing and on the other side is the purple algae. 
If I flip it, flip it over, I can see purple algae is showing, and on the other side, there's blue algae, and that's what these tiles show you. So again, this means what? Orange is dominant over white. It's showing purple algae, and I know on the back there's red algae. If I flip it over, I'll see the opposite. White dominant over orange, red algae here, and I know on the back there's purple algae. So that's how you read these tiles. There's going to be 10 of them laid out, and those will tell you what the ecosystem looks like. Okay, so now take a look at this ecosystem. This has the 10 colors and showing you which is dominant over which. Now, if you were to pick what color is the strongest color of coral in the ecosystem right now? The answer is pink, because here, 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 and here. Pink is dominant over all the other colors. Pink is over white, pink is over yellow, pink is over orange, and pink is over the grayish black. Which is weak? Yellow and gray are both very weak, because gray is only dominant over yellow, yellow is only dominant over orange. Orange is dominant over two, and white is dominant over two. Why is that important? Because of final scoring. Remember I said at the end of the game you're going to get one point for each tile you eat, plus a bonus of one point everywhere that tile is dominant. So each pink tile at the end of the game, if the game ended like this, would be worth five points. One for the tile, and four for the places of dominance. Each gray tile, on the other hand, would be worth how many? Two points. One for the tile, and one for the place of dominance. If gray was not dominant here, each gray tile would only be worth one point at the end of the game. So during the game, your goal is to eat tiles, and then try and ensure that those colors are dominant at the end of the game. Now how do these colors change? Well, this is where that algae comes into play. During the game, you'll have the chance to play these algae discs. And these algae discs are of a color. This is a red algae disc. And if I were to play this red algae disc, it would flip over every tile where there's a big spot of red algae. So I can see if I were to play the red disc, it would flip over these two tiles because there's red algae. And that notice that brings another color of algae up on top. And then let's say later in the game, Someone played a blue disc. The blue would flip over all the tiles where there's blue algae showing. So that would be these four. So this is what's going to happen. During the game, there'll be an ebb and flow as different colors become dominant and they are able to then consume the other colors. I'll talk about that a little bit later. You do have the ability as the game goes on to lock down a color. And that is a key part to ensuring that your tiles are worth lots of points at the end of the game. The way you'd lock down a color is, let's say I wanted to lock down this white on top of gray. I would play a purple disc, and I'd play it right on top of the algae. Now what happens is that one now can never be flipped for the rest of the game. And if all 10 get locked down, the game ends. That's another way the game can end. But what will also happen is everything else that's showing purple will flip. So if I lock one down, it does not flip, and it stays that way, but every, everything else showing purple does flip. And so that'll go on during the game. You'll be flipping back and forth, trying to keep your tiles on as many dominant positions as possible. And those are the tiles that are sitting in your fish's belly. Get in my belly. So now you understand how the environment works. Now let's take a look at how these coral reefs grow. Now again, there's going to be one board like this for each player. And notice the board does have a couple holes in it. These are places where the reefs can't go. There's also a spot on the board with a starfish on it, and that's important. I'll talk about that later. When you start the game, you're going to match up one space of reef on each of the spaces on the board that are marked with the same color. So that's where they start, and they're going to grow out from there. Although, a reef can actually start on any space. So on my turn, if I wanted to make the pink reef get bigger, one thing I can do is I can add to it, and I can add to it by playing extra tiles. And so each tile will go next to what's already there. In order to expand this pink reef, you'll also have to play a pink larvae cube. You'll get one of these cubes as well as some additional tiles at the end of each turn of the game. If, for whatever reason, I don't want to grow that pink reef, I can start my own pink reef down here, wherever I'd like. I can bring it in and start moving across the board that way. Notice the space with the starfish on it. Whenever you grow next to the starfish space like this, then the starfish space, if it is blank, immediately grows another tile of that type. What this does is balance the game, because the edges of the board are safer to be on, but the middle of the board is going to get you an extra space whenever you go next to it. If by some reason this space gets cleared out during play, then another player can actually grow by playing next to the starfish space, and that space will grow another tile. Now, another thing that can happen during your turn is you can actually claim a coral reef by putting one of your shrimples on that reef, and that's going to claim this whole pink reef. 
And so as the game goes on, you'll be able to play two of your shrimp bowls on any one board, claiming different reefs. So I could claim that one as well if I wanted to do that. Now, the effect that has is that if we have a reef here that's claimed, and then we have a reef here that's claimed, let's assume the setup was like this, neither green nor red, oh, he's blind, he cannot see, help. Ah, much better. Neither green nor red would be able to play a pink tile there because these are going to have to remain as two separate reefs. One can't take over the other at this point. Now, if red moved away for some reason, then green would be able to play in the middle and, and make a very large pink reef. Now, earlier I talked about one color having dominance over another color. Here's how that plays out. Let's say that this tile was showing with this side up, meaning pink was stronger than orange, and this were the situation. Now, this is the green shrimp's reef, and over here is the red shrimp's reef. But the pink has the ability to swallow up the orange. Here's the way that works. Someone could play a pink tile extending the pink reef onto this space. And this is going to take this piece out and put down a pink. And that's because pink is dominant over orange. Now, what's important to notice is where the shrimple sits, it protects its space and the four spaces that are adjacent to that space, but it doesn't protect any of the rest. So pink can't go any further right now because that's where the shrimp is sitting. So the shrimp is guarding this piece. One thing you can do during your turn is you can actually move your shrimp around, which is a smart thing to do because that's gonna help you protect those front borders of your coral reef. It's gonna be harder to get at these other things. Now let's say later on, this got flipped. So remember to flip this over, someone would have to play a red algae disc, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. That would flip this over, so the orange was dominant over pink. Now at this point, you can't come this way because this shrimple is protecting the space. But you could be clever and come around the top like so, and then come over the top like this, and begin eating into the, the coral reef this way. Now one thing about taking over is you cannot start to have one reef take over another until the reef is at least two spaces big. So if this were the situation and black were dominant over pink, black could not take over that pink. But as soon as black grew a second space, now that black reef is too big, it's strong enough to begin taking over another color. And what's gonna go on throughout the game is that there's gonna be this ebb and flow, is that the colors are gonna change, dominance will change, and the colors of the reefs will change. Now notice what happens here. If this happens, this now is a separate pink reef than the rest of it. And so another player could come in with their shrimp bowl and claim that little pink space. If, for example, they wanted to keep this space could never be played upon, and then green would be cut off from what they had before. So that can be something clever to do. Now you know enough about the basic concept, so now I'm going to move on to the sequence of play. This is the reference card that comes with the game, and each player has one, and this is very useful in helping you remember what your choices are. If you don't handle pictures too well, on the back there is text of what you can do, but I'll explain it using the pictures. So during your turn, you can start by doing number one, and you end by doing number ten, and then you can do whatever from two through nine that you would like to do. So I'll explain each of them now. Start with number one. Number one means that you're going to feed your parrot fish. This is where you choose one of your shrimples, you eat its whole reef, four of them go out of the game, and whatever is left over goes into the belly of your parrot fish. I showed you that earlier. Notice you only get to do that once at the start of your turn. What that means is in the situation, you're gonna build up your reefs and then you're gonna hopefully hang on to them through everyone else's turn so that at the start of your turn, you can eat it up and score some points. Most of the time you're going to eat your reeves, they might be at six or seven or eight tiles large. Four of them go away, so you'll end up with two, three, or four tiles in your belly, which is going to help you score points. Now we'll talk through the rest of these things. Now these don't have to be done in any order. Some things can be done once during your turn, and other things can be done as many times as you'd like during your turn. Now, stages two and three are how you introduce new coral reef tiles onto the board. And what's important for this is the concept of the screen. Each player has a player screen. They're gonna have some tiles that are hidden behind their screen, and they're gonna have some tiles that are out in front for everyone to see. These tiles out in front of your screen, I think of them as the currency of the game. You're gonna spend them to do various things, and you can spend them right now if you'd like. When you decide to take actions two and three, you get to play a cube and up to four of your tiles from behind your screen, onto the board. It, number three is the same thing, and what this means is you can do this twice during your turn. So two times during your turn, you can add to the coral reefs. The way that's gonna work is you take one of these cubes that you've gotten in during the game. So in this case, a white cube, so I'm gonna do things in white. I can then take up to four white tiles from behind my screen. 
I can then take as many white tiles as I wish from the front of my screen and play them all on the board. So if I manage this, then let me play six white tiles on the board. Now as I play those tiles, I may be able to chomp someone else's stuff. So let's say we have this board here, and we'll say that white is dominant over yellow and over black. So what I could do is I could begin playing, and I could play there. Now remember, you can't eat another color until you have at least two down. So now I have four more to go. Remember, white is dominant over yellow, so I can eat this one up. And this yellow one now goes in front of my screen. That's really important. That's how you're going to get new things in front of your screen. If your screen is here, and I just ate that up, then I get that in front of my screen, and I put down the white. Now, notice that this shrimp is protecting this orange, so I can't go up there. But we'll assume white is also dominant over black, so I can go down there, and I can eat up this black. I put this black in front of my screen, and I can eat up this black, and put this black in front of my screen. And that would be my action of playing new tiles. Again, it costs you a cube of the matching color. You can take up to four from behind your screen, and you can take as many of that same color from in front of your screen and use those. So in a future turn, I'm going to be able to have a stronger play of black tiles onto the board and a stronger play of yellow tiles onto the board. And this is what you're doing. You're setting yourself up by taking tiles in one color and you're going to play them later on. Options four and five have to do with moving your shrimple. In option four, it lets you introduce a new shrimple from behind your screen onto a tile. So that's very simple. You take one of your, your four shrimps are going to stay in behind your screen when you start. You're going to take one and you put it somewhere on the board. And that lets you claim that reef. You may not play it on another shrimple's reef. That is illegal. Number five is move a shrimple. And so that allows you to move one around to another space. You can temporarily move it just onto an empty space if you need to do that in order to make a play and then move it again later on. And notice the number five does not have the one times by it. So you can do that as many times as you'd like during the turn. Stages six and seven are how you're going to spend this currency that's in front of your screen. And number six, it lets you exchange one of those tiles for a cube of the same color. So what I can do is I can take a tile like this, turn it in, and in this case I would get a gray cube from the bank. So number seven is how you're going to change the environment. And it lets you take any tile from in front of your screen and discard it and get an algae token of whatever color you'd like. I could turn in this chit, take a red algae token, and put it down in this circle here, which indicates the last token played was red. And then I would flip this, and this, and this one, since they all are showing the red algae. Earlier I talked about the ability to lock down one of these things. And the way that works, if you've eaten at least one of your shrimps, then you have the ability to do this. And you'll indicate that down here. So once you eat your first shrimp, you'll put him down here, which indicates you have the ability to lock these tiles. The way that would work is, if it were my turn, I could choose to take action number seven, exchange one of these tiles for a token, and let's say that I wanted to lock this one in place. What I do is I then take a green algae token like this, I put it on that, it locks it in place, and then I flip over all of the other greens that are showing. Now, this can never be changed again throughout the whole game. I know that black will be dominant over orange. And the game can end if all 10 of these get locked down. Number eight is fairly simple. Turn in a cube and get a tile of the same type behind your screen. So I could turn in this cube and I could get a white tile. It doesn't tend to be very useful. Number nine is do nothing. So what that indicates is you don't have to do any of these things if you don't want to. Last, number 10. This is how you're going to replenish your hand. You do this finally. So first you do one, you do as much of two through nine as you'd like, and then you do number 10. For that, you use the bottom part of the board here. And the way this works is you pick one square and you take everything in that square. So I could take this pink cube and these three tiles, or that orange cube and those three tiles, or that yellow cube and those two tiles. There's going to be a different number of tiles whenever you look at the board. So let's say I took this one. I took the gray and then the two gray and the white. And that's pretty good. You always want to try and match up your cubes and your tiles. So I could take these things, and then I'd get to add those to behind my screen. And then what you do is you replenish the board, you put one new cube in, and then you put one tile in each square where there is fewer than three. So there's never going to be more than three in any of these squares. This has the effect of getting people to take different colors. But if you ever don't have enough tiles or cubes to fill up one of these squares, the game ends right away. 
So that's the way your turn goes. You eat one of your shrimp if you want to score points. You can make the corals grow. You can put your shrimps and move your shrimps. You can get the cubes or you can get the discs or you can get a cube by turning in a tile. You can do nothing and then you're gonna get more stuff. And sometimes that's all you do is you get more stuff. If you're pretty weak, you may just wanna replenish your stuff because this game really rewards taking large amounts of tiles. Because when you take tiles on the board, Remember, the one way to get tiles in front of your screen is by taking them off the board, and that's a good thing to do consistently. All right, let's have a sample turn now so you can see how things might go. Now, in this case, you're the purple player. Here's your situation. You've got a screen. Behind the screen, you've got one white larvae cube and three tiles, and you've got three pink tiles. You've got a black and a yellow in front of your screen. Here's the board situation. These are two of the boards that would be out, and you can see that you've been trying to work pink pretty heavily. But what happened in the last turn is that you had a nice pink reef here, and this, this player, the yellow player, cut right through it with their black, making it a lot harder for you to reconnect. So you gotta figure out what to do. Also, white is currently dominant over pink. So here's your situation. So first thing you can do is you can give up and abandon this pink. And what you can do is pick your shrimp up and move them over to there. So you're gonna to get to take up to four whites from behind your screen, and as many as you have in front of your screen, we have three whites here, so you'll begin to eat these up. Om nom 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 nom. Oh wait, no, that's the sound the fish make. This is the sound that corals make, which is These go actually in front of your screen now, so those are gonna be useful a bit later. Now over here, we want to grow this reef, but we see there's a problem in that white's dominant over pink. Well, that's easy. You spend one of your tiles from in front of your screen, and flip it. So you're gonna get a green algae cylinder and you'll flip that over. The green cylinder will just go on the board and any of the other tiles that we're showing green as well will also be flipped. So now pink is dominant over white. But the problem is I don't have a pink cube. I wasn't planning for this. I've been playing a lot of pink. But I can use one of the steps to get rid of one of these tiles so I get a pink cube. And I'll take the two that are in front of my screen I can get rid of the pink cube. I can take up to four tiles from behind my screen. And then I'll go over here and begin to munch. Nom, 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 nom. The green player wasn't expecting that because we, d we had white dominant over pink. So now the green player is saying, of course, bad words. Now notice the way I did this. It does a few things. Remember, you have to have at least two tiles in a coral reef to begin taking it over. There's only one left here. So I'm gonna be okay. So these whites go in front of my screen and I wanna spend another tile, get rid of this black one to get a purple algae cube, and that lets me lock this one down. And we'll assume that I've already eaten a shrimp, so I'm able to do that. So now, I don't have to worry about white coming back because pink is going to always be better than white. So at this point, I have two fronts to deal with. Either one could come in and cut things off, and so what I've gotta do is figure out which person I'm more afraid about, what sort of resources they have, and whether I wanna try and protect the front here from orange coming in and maybe giving up those, or protect the front here from yellow coming in and maybe giving up some of these, I'll have to make that decision. But that's what the game's all about. If I can hang on to a lot of that, then I'll eat that reef next turn and we'll make a lot of points. So there are four ways to end the game. First, if you have locked down all the coral tiles with the algae cylinders, the game ends. Second, when someone eats all their shrimps, the game will end. Third, if there's nowhere left to play a tile on the board, the game will end. And fourth, if there aren't enough tiles or cubes to refill, then the game will end. So if the game ends because all the coral tiles are locked down or someone eats all their shrimp, everyone gets one final turn to just eat. And in this final eating turn, they can come and eat one shrimp and the coral reef it's on, but you lose five of them. And so in this case, if this were what I ate in my final turn, these five would go and I would just get this one tile into my belly. But that's the goal, is to get tiles in the belly of your fish. And remember, at the end of the game, each tile in your, in your fish's belly is worth a base of one, plus a bonus one everywhere that tile is dominant. So this yellow tile would be worth three points. And you total up your points and you see who's won. And that is the encounter of the reef. So before I sum up, let's hear a little bit more from the designer about what new people should think about when you're playing this game. I know there's uh, a strategy which has become to known as the blitz strategy, which I must admit I do sometimes I've duck myself. And the game will finish either when all of the coral tiles are locked down or probably equally as frequently when one person has eaten their fourth shrimp. You have to keep an eye on how many shrimps people have eaten because the end of the game can come quite quickly. 
and what some people will do is go for eating four small, poly, uh, small coals and you'll still be struggling to build a nice big one but you won't get time to eat it. Um, that's one way the game can develop. The game can also develop where you are um, creating larger coals and you feel a balance in the game as other people are doing the same. Well, you made it. That's Reef Encounter. Now it's pretty complex. There's a lot going on in this game and so it's not a game I'd recommend for people who haven't done a lot of these sorts of strategy games. But once you get into it, there's a lot going on here. It can be very interesting to watch as the coral reefs take each other over and the shrimps hold for control and the parrotfish just says, get it, ma, belly. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting game. It's a strategy game. Uh, it is an in-depth game, very cute components, but there's a lot going on here. So what's the grade? Well, I've decided I'm not giving grades anymore. Everything was getting an A or an A minus or maybe a B plus or maybe a B and it, that grade inflation thing just really wasn't working out. So I've explained a lot about the game. It's not a game for kids, despite what it looks like. It's a game for people who like to plan, that like strategy, uh, that like coming up with clever ways to use different components and different turn actions. And so if that sounds something like you might enjoy, then give Reef Encounter a try. So until next time, I'll be heading out to go see the real Reef Encounter. Bye bye! What advice would I give to people who wanted to publish their own game or divine a game? I think on the design sign, uh, what would be most useful? Uh, or what you really want to do is to play as many games as you can to find out what works in a game and what doesn't work in a game. Um, you need a lot of enthusiasm to carry a project through. You need to accept that if you are going to try to get your game published through a larger company, they will deal with possibly have two or three, four uh, submissions a day and your chances of getting published are not great. I've been fortunate um, particularly with one game which I had which was Keedon which was reissued by Hans and Gluck in a very different form um, but with many of the core ideas uh, still in place. Um, so you need to prepare for that disappointment um, but you can take a different route and the route that I've chosen um, I think the games I've published have been good enough to publish uh, I enjoy playing them but I'm not sure that there is a huge market necessarily for the games of this level of complexity there is a market um, and obviously the games that I've produced have sold which is nice for me um, but what I've done is I've gone through and I've published the games by going through the design process I've, I've mentioned. But in doing that I've needed contacts. I've needed contacts for the artwork. I've needed some finance in order to be able to fund the development of the game. Um, and I've needed people that were happy to playtest the game with me uh, and feed off their enthusiasm as well. Other advice I think is be very careful before you decide to take the leap and do not publish a game without thoroughly testing it and without blind testing it and that means sending the game away to someone else who will test the game for you without you being present and without you being perhaps related to them or they've been friends of yours um, it's easy in the gaming community I think to make those type of contacts um, but what you will then get is feedback um, which is we enjoyed the game or we didn't enjoy the game but someone else not enjoying the game is a lot better than you investing a lot of money in producing a game which doesn't sell and you will find there are several or many sad stories at Essendon and other places of people who will come to the show with a couple of thousand games and then will go home with the show from the show with a couple of thousand games and that's a big investment and it's a lot of space in your garage so be very wary before you take the leap but if you get the right feedback or you've got the confidence then do that maybe with a small run first I think another company that's done similar things to myself are Fraggle Games have had a very positive experience 
and then people like Martin Warris who started from a small collection of issuing or bringing even 50 odd games, white box games to Essen, slowly building up a reputation and the contacts and now you know I think Martin is probably recognised as being the premier UK games designer with the, the, the Age of Steam and, and the other games that uh, he's producing on, on a regular basis. So it can be done and it's hugely enjoyable but you've probably heard this from other people the only way to make a small fortune from gaming or usually the only way is to start off with a large fortune and just bear that in mind um, even at my level of success which I, I, I qualify um, I make a little bit of money but I really don't make much um, by the time I've come to Essen I've paid for the hotel, I've paid for the stand, I've paid for the artwork I've given a few copies to the press and the, the special people that have been involved in the project. Um, even though I sell at a higher price than I would really like to sell, and for this year the cost has been 30 euros for a little box with cards and wooden pieces. And they say, why is it 30 euros? It's just a little box. But you actually look at the game and the artwork that's into it, the production that's gone into it, the cost that's gone into it by producing top quality game in, Euro in, in Germany and I, I plug Ludofact uh, as someone that I've worked with and had a very positive experience with and if you are looking to do a quality game in Germany and even have the benefit of having the games delivered to the show to you, well packed, um, which is also a big plus, then I would recommend Ludofact as an avenue to explore. So it can be done but in many circumstances it's not always a happy ending so be careful before you jump. And then later on uh, we join. We have a Mr Thornquist in the background who is probably well known to some of us viewers. Hello Rick. Um, okay where was I? So that was a long time ago, that was 89 and what I did was discover discover German games. <laughs>